Thank you all for coming. Um, we're delighted to be here to talk to you a little bit about apps, about the experiences that we both had at our news organizations. And uh, we both plan this as more of a conversation. We don't want to be standing here talking at you guys. We're going to be asking each other questions. And what we'd really hope is that this can also be a conversation with the audience. There is perhaps nothing more dispiriting than to be at a speech with a room full of journalists and to not hear any questions. So I'm hopeful this room full of journalists will have a lot of great questions for us. Uh, and feel free to interrupt us. Anything comes to mind. We really want this to be a kind of a great, almost a brainstorming session among all of us about how to create great apps and how to think more about what the mobile experience is, both for the news organizations that you guys represent or other organizations, and for the users, of course, for our readers, our viewers, our listeners, the people uh, that we're trying to serve, the people that we're trying to get our great journalism to. So the thing I wanted to start off discussing was newsroom culture. When both of us set out to create apps at our own newsrooms, uh, the BBC and the New York Times, one of the things that we first confronted was this issue of the newsroom culture. The Times, as you know, is a very old organization with a obviously terrific, terrific tradition of journalism, but it's a tradi terrific tradition of doing a certain type of journalism. And we had made the transition pretty decently from print to the web, and all of a sudden we were confronted with the age of mobile. And to some extent, that was just an evolution of journalism. It was an evolution of the way people were coming to us, the way people were reading the New York Times. But another way of thinking, it changed everything. And why did it change everything? Well, the phone is a deeply, deeply personal device. It's far more personal, as we all know, than certainly than a print newspaper. And it's far more personal than a computer screen, than a desktop or a laptop. You take the phone everywhere. You sleep next to the phone. Your photos are on the phone. You communicate with your family and your friends on the phone. You have Facebook. You have Twitter. You have all these, all these aspects of the phone that make it far, far different than any device really ever created by, by humankind before. At the times, we had had a much more kind of sort of arm's length relationship with our readers. Um, back in the days of print, it was we published, we gave it to you, and you did whatever you want with it. That was it. It was a real distance. Um, then we came to the web, and that changed a little bit. But with the phone, everything changed, as I, say, as I said. Um, all of a sudden, there was a much more personal relationship between the user and our journalism. And that meant we had to change as well in the newsroom of the Times. We had to be thinking much more about what is the user experience of the Times. Um, what is the, what, how, are, how are users uh, interacting with us during different times of the day? Uh, how are users feeling about the kind of the voice of the Times or the presentation of the Times? That meant that for the newsroom culture of the Times, we had to be thinking a lot differently. So I kind of wanted to start the conversation off there. How from a traditional newsroom culture or a traditional news organization culture can you create a great news app? Can you create a great news experience? Natalie, you want to tell us a little bit about what that was like at the BBC? <laughs> Um, so I think the challenge was twofold. On the, on the one hand, we have a very um, strong digital team who's been doing desktop brilliantly for about 18 years. So the challenge for them is, you know, they work in front of desktops, is how, how to get them to start thinking about the experience on mobile, that kind of more personal thing, the more tactile thing, you know, what people want to read early in the morning, what they want to read late at night, how they read it. And then the second challenge is with the reporters, if you want to, how they report differently, and you know, for some people who may not even have made the full transition to desktop to go straight to mobile, really, and just to, to think about how people are consuming their story and you know, all that stuff about tone. And some people get it absolutely brilliantly, <coughs> and they're just natural. And you know, ju it's, it's storytelling, really. That's what it is at its most basic. But for other people who just kind of, their world is a 16 by 9 screen, it, it's far harder, I think. You know, at the times, one of the things I realized was that we were reporting our stories, we were editing our stories, we were creating our storytelling, we were creating our journalism on desktops. But a lot of people were consuming that exact same journalism on small devices. And it's not just that they were consuming it on small devices, they were consuming it on small devices when they were standing in the line at Starbucks, when they were running for, for a subway train, or when they were doing all sorts of stuff. 
the experience, the experience of the creation of the journalism really kind of clashed with the experience of the consumption of the journalism. So that was another change we had to talk a lot about in the newsroom of the Times. I don't know if any of you heard about this, but we did an experiment uh, a, a few months ago. Where we actually shut down desktop access to the New York Times. And that was to try to sensitize people a little bit to the idea that, hey, you have to be thinking really, really, almost obsessively about what is the experience of the New York Times on the phone. And that doesn't mean taking a desktop computer and having a little cutout to show a mobile feed in a desktop computer. Because again, it is the experience of having it on a phone, doing all sorts of other things in your life, that is really the true mobile experience. It's a short attention experience at times, although the truth is, is that for us, at least at the New York Times, people read long stories all the time. But it's also just the idea of movement, the idea of this thing being with you all the time. Did you have a question? I'd say yes, but I'm a mobile editor, so <laughs> you'd expect that. But I think definitely, as you know, if, if more than 50% of your audience is consuming you on mobile, and actually coming to you probably more often, so more times in the day, then that is your starting point. And I also wonder, you know, I think as journalists, it's very easy to get caught up in, but people will miss all this fantastic stuff. Do they really? And, and I think that's kind of the other, the other angle to, to getting people on board with mobile is, journalists obviously use it and read stories on mobile, but they're reading them as journalists. And that means they're really keen on all the detail and every single last bit of the Iran-US nuclear deal. When actually, if you're waiting for the bus and you have two minutes, you just want the top line. So it's, it, it's thinking more about the audience and thinking what they need at given moments of the day. I, I will take a slightly contrarian <laughs> point of view. Oh, you would. Uh, um, <laughs> you know, people sometimes in the Times come up to me and they say, how can I do this story better for mobile? Or how can I write this better for mobile? How can I edit this mobile? How can we be better on mobile? And the truth is, is that I actually think that's a sort of reductive thinking. It's kind of going for the next big thing, the next shiny object. The fact is, is that what mobile does is it, 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 it forces, you to fo for, forces you to focus much more on the user experience for all the reasons that I just kind of bloviated about. So w that user experience is important in all realms of journalism. You know? It's important on the web, it's important in print, it's important in everything we do. So don't think so much about, well, it's just gonna look great on a small screen, that's obviously important. Be thinking about what is the user experience, because the fact is, is that if you can improve the user experience for a mobile reader, that same thing will be a great experience for the web reader and the print reader. And I'll give you another, a perfect example of this. We have a, um, a tendency at, at the New York Times to write long leads of stories. Um, it's a long tradition, as some of the times people in this uh, room can tell you, that we've had to fight against for years. And for years there have been these crusades going back to, you know, as long as I've been there, we have to write shorter leads because readers get lost. They don't, you know, it becomes almost like homework to get through them. That has been exaggerated by mobile. When a lead to a story, when the first paragraph for the story takes up a whole screen on the mobile a, a, a whole screen on a mobile phone, that's a terrible experience. Like, no one wants to wade through that. If you shorten that lead, if you make it much, more, much tighter, much more pointed, that's actually a much better lead for the web. It's a much better lead for print. It's a much later, better lead for everyone. So when you're thinking about mobile, you should almost substitute it as just thinking about what is the user experience. And for us at the Times, that's what mobile has really done. It has forced us to be thinking much more about what the user experience is for all our types of journalism. And it's actually had a, a really positive impact for me personally, even thinking about print and thinking about all these other platforms. And that to me is the kind of, to some extent, is the sea change. So when you're thinking about mobile apps, obviously that's where you start, but let that philosophy almost kind of um, color everything that you do. So how, how do you go around persuading the writer who loves every single word of his well-crafted piece to say, do you know what, that lead's just too long. It well, needs to be a quarter of that. Well, I actually, I actually, I, I mean, I, 
there's the kind of the polite way, there's the obnoxious way, um, and I sometimes vacillate between both. I mean, one thing that I do is I will take screenshots of stories, uh, New York Times stories, and I will send them to editors and say, look at this. This is how your story is presenting on the phone. And it actually gets back to something I said earlier, which is these stories are being reported and written and edited on desktop computers, often with massive screens. So a lead, uh, a lead, for, a lead paragraph for an article on a big, massive desktop screen looks totally fine. It may not even take more than two lines. That same lead will be like 15 lines on an iPhone, you know, an iPhone 6 screen, let alone an iPhone 5 or 4 screen. And so I do that. Sometimes I say to people, and this is the sort of more obnoxious way, which I try not to do too much, but you know, I say to people, try reading that lead without taking a breath. Um, and it's hard. And the, you know, the truth is, is that this is where like, tradition fights against user experience. This is where tradition kind of fights against what readers really want. Um, you know, this kind of leads to the next thing that, that Natalie and I have talked a lot about and have thought a lot about, which is the issue of voice and presentation and tone. You want to talk a little bit about what, what, you're, what you've been doing on the BBC with that? Yeah, well, I, I think it, it's quite a difficult one for organizations like ours, which use the same content across the piece. So, um, Unlike you, you have a separate team for NYT Now, for example. Right. We, we manage things once, and the content goes to mobile web, it goes to the app, and therefore the voice is the same everywhere. We, we're fortunate in some ways in that we, um, we were kind of tied to very old technology called Teletext or CFAX, which meant that everything we wrote traditionally had to, the whole story had to be encapsulated in the first four lines, and they had to be very short because they had to fit on an old small TV screen. So we've continued that tradition, which helps us get to the point very quickly. What it doesn't necessarily do is give it a voice or you know, give it a bit more, you know, what people call authenticity now, I guess. And that, for us as a broadcaster, which is very committed to impartiality, is very difficult as well. So I think it's sometimes more about finding ways to do that with pictures, there are kind of other things that come into play there, but our writing, I think, is quite standard across the piece. I think there's a question there. If I yeah, so what have you learned about the incorporation of video into your native apps in the sense that video, the, the user doesn't always have, a, have the context for video is appropriate. They may not have privacy, they may not have headphones, they may not want to take the time to listen to you coming for a couple of minutes, just want to read it. So how have you, what, what have you learned about incorporating video and where it works and where it doesn't work? So we've, um, we, um, we launched a new version of our app um, in January in the UK and internationally this summer, and it, it, video is far more prominent, and what we have seen is a, is a really steep rise in usage of video, so there is an appetite for it. Um, we don't use autoplay on phones, so people have the choice to click. It's very clear, if they're clicking onto something that's just video, it's very clear, and if video is at the top of a story or embedded in a story, it, it's, it's their option, and the whole, the whole story is there in text as well, so they, do, they can choose that we are seeing more and more people watching video. I think also, you know, as with some of the things I've been saying earlier, video on the phone really forces you to be thinking about, well, what is the attention span of this person? Uh, will they get bored of this video really quickly? Can we take this five minute video and turn it into 90 seconds and make it as satisfying a news experience as it is at five minutes? Often the question is yes. The reason we, it's a five minute video is because that's what we've often produced. That's what we've been producing for years. That's what we put on the web. The fact is, is that you know, it's hard to get people to watch a five minute news video on a phone, especially if it has sound, you know, for those very reasons. People often don't want to watch videos on the phone with sound unless it's at night or they're in a, you know, in a private spot. So it, for us at the Times, it's got us thinking a lot about brevity, about being especially pointed, uh, about framing. Uh, on the phone, we've been really working hard on how to frame short news videos, ensuring that people know this is a video, know that they can watch it, and know that it's really short. One of the big issues with videos on the phone, especially, is the burden of time. If someone sees that it's, you know, this is nine minutes, they're just not going to start. Like, who among you today, over the course of ONA, or the course of even your normal work life, would see a nine minute video during the day and say, I'm gonna, t you know, unless it's the most incredible thing ever, you know, it's gonna say, I'm gonna take nine minutes out of my busy day and watch this video. It's just not gonna happen. And so, you know, we've had to think a lot about that. And that's also a big change in newsroom culture for us. Uh, people feel like, you know, both on the, in, in the traditional newsroom, in the video unit, in these places that, 
our storytelling is our, is our value, it's our virtue, and we have to be telling stories in a particular way. And often enough, that means length. Now, there is a very important place for length in the New York Times and in all your great news organizations, don't get me wrong. Uh, we have m stories that are four, five, 6,000 words long that people read on the phone and complete, and it, they find it very satisfying. Having said that, however, it is very clear that it has to be the right kind of story, and it's very clear that um, you know, brevity has a real place on the phone. But I also find with video, for example, that we often try to tell the full story, and it's often a very complicated story with lots of angles, and actually you can break it down quite easily into two or three, and I think it's much easier as a consumer to view you know, two 90-second or 60-second videos than to sit down in one sitting and watch five. And actually, it's much easier to absorb the content as well. You're probably going to get the information in a much more efficient way. So we're, we're kind of doing a lot of work around that as well, and as you say, framing and thinking about you know, when, when does a video need text on screen because you think that people won't have headphones with them or you know, just won't want to put them in. So. Yeah, so So TV people hate me for saying this, but I love it. And <laughs> I think it, when you try it and when you watch it on a phone and when it's done well and when it's done vertically, actually filmed with vertical in mind, it can be absolutely brilliant. And the reason it's brilliant goes back to Cliff's earlier point about something personal. So we've, we've done a few experiments with reporters. And basically, you, you, it's like you're FaceTiming someone. So they're talking directly to you. You know, it, it, it's very challenging in other ways because you can fit very little text and people can't read much, so you're just picking out keywords. Um, graphics you have to make specially, but it can be done. And, and I think, you know, I, I wouldn't say I'd do it for everything, but I think for certain things it's certainly very powerful. And I will say, it, you know, it seems to me kind of ridiculous to ignore the fact that a lot of users, a lot of people who are using iPhones or Android or whatever, love vertical video. And you have to go where users are. You have to be thinking about what your users want to consume. You can't fight that. And I, I have no doubt in the next few years, newsrooms across the world will be adopting ver vertical video in a very dramatic way. Now, that doesn't mean standard kind of landscape horizontal video will not be continuing to be important. It certainly will. Um, but if everybody, you know, again, it comes, it, it, it brings back this issue of the personalized nature of the iPhone or the mobile phone in general. If people are using phones in a personal way for all sorts of things, they can't silo off in their mind how they're using news apps. That is for us, you know, for journalists, that's a kind of old way of thinking. We do something so special that it will be divorced from the rest of users' reality. And we cannot be thinking that way anymore. Uh, it is very important that we think about how people are using the phone uh, during the time of day, for example. You know, one of the first ways that I, that I succeeded in evangelizing at the Times about the phone was simply showing people the traffic for the iPhone app for the New York Times and how it changed over the course of the day. At the Times, as I'm sure most news organizations, the highest traffic during the 24-hour period is between about 7 a.m. and 9 a.m. And when I first showed that to people in the newsroom at the Times, they were flabbergasted. They just could not believe it. Because that's just, you know, it sort of makes sense when you really think about it, but that was not web usage. Web usage begins when people get into their office and it really sort of peaks about noon and it's like a, it's like a sort of an oval, a half oval. Mobile usage spikes at 7, 8 a, 7 or 8 a.m. What does that mean for the newsroom culture of a place like the New York Times? It means you can't give them warmed over coverage from the night before at 7 a.m. You have to give them something special. Because when they wake up in the morning, the first thing they do is they go look at their phone. And if they're just getting some old stuff from the night before, that's not going to cut it. Because everyone else is giving them new stuff. You know? The weather app is giving them new stuff. You know? Facebook is giving them new stuff from their friends. They're getting new stuff from Twitter. It can't be the New York Times is just kind of the slow guy who just kind of eventually will get to it. So that to me was, so analytics is one way that you can actually change your newsroom culture. You can show to reporters, hey, Everybody's on the phone at 8 a.m. What are we giving them at 8 a.m.? And at the Times, we've adapted to that a lot. We've created something called New York Today, which is like a New York tip sheet 
that goes up at 6 a.m. We've created something called the morning briefing, which is another tip sheet that goes up at 6 a.m. And the traffic on both of those is very, very strong. Now, they're, very, they're well done. The people who put them together are terrific. But the real thing is that everybody is on the phone at that time. And we've been thinking about what does the user need at that time? If you look at, 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 at how you guys use the phone, if you look at how people use the phone in general, when you wake up, you want to know, A, is the world still around? Did anything crazy happen overnight? Is everything OK? If not, well, then you have bigger problems. But um, uh, you know, what was the news overnight? Prepare me for the day. So we think a lot, when we were thinking about NYT now, we were thinking about moments of the day. The first moment is wake me up. Prepare me for the day. Tell me what happened overnight. Get me up to speed. Make it so that when I get into the office at 9 or 10, no one can say anything that will catch me off guard. I will be the person in the know. I will know the headlines. I will know the most important stories of the day. I will feel confident in the news. And that's very, very important. I don't want a 1,000 words on everything. I want two paragraphs, just so I can know what are the important stories. If I want to go deeper, help me go deeper, but just let me skim the news so I just can be confident. Then at the end of the day, what do you want at the end of the day? You want to catch up. You know, you want to make sure you didn't miss anything, but maybe you're a little tired. Maybe you want to read some features. Maybe you want to read some light stories. So at the end of the day, we have an evening briefing that we give people, and it's just to kind of catch people up with the most important moments. So can I ask you on that? So has it, because it's done brilliantly on MIT now, but has it changed your thinking for, do you call it the traditional app or the old app? Yeah, I mean, um, the, uh, the morning briefing and the evening briefing started on NYT now, and they were, they were very popular on NYT now, and it made us realize that you know, they'd be very popular for all our audiences. So we moved them to the main New York Times app, which we call, refer, often refer to as the core app, and the website, and, uh, and, and our other platforms, including Twitter and Facebook. And they're, they're very popular on those as well. And again, they're very well executed. But I mean, when we, fir I'll, 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 when we first created this thing called New York Today, which is this morning tip sheet, we got a great response from readers. You know, we got hundreds of emails how great this is. And the truth is, is that, you know, I thought, wow, we are geniuses. We did the most amazing thing in the world. And then I sort of realized, well, actually, we just copied the Today Show, you know? I mean, it was just getting up in the morning, you know, traffic and weather and sort of the important stories of the day. But a traditional news organization had never done that before. The tra traditional news organization had never really thought about the user experience across the course of the day in a way that really helped readers. The Times had always been very good about thinking about the week. On Wednesday, we gave you the dining section. On Monday, we gave, uh, Tuesday, we gave you the science section. We were good on weekly habituation. We were, ter we were terrible on daily habituation. You know, there was no sense across the course of the day that we're giving you this piece of content for this reason because we know your, user, your need as a user at this particular time is this. I think there's, because, you know, morning briefings are brilliant, and I'm sure a lot of you use them, but there's also something about how you curate your, your app for early in the morning and for late in the evening, which is very different. I mean, it's kind of, you know, people need to know whether they can get to work for a start. So if there's traffic news that's relevant, if there's bad weather, um, when you live in places with lots of bad weather, um, you know, it's kind of thinking about what's going to set people's day up properly as well yeah. when you curate it. So is that also changing your core app? Yeah, it has changed our core app as well. Um, I mean, the core app is a, is a bigger audience and it's a broader audience. So that, that has required us to think a little bit differently in how we use the core app, but, or how we curate the core app. But you know, the, the, the impact of NYT now on the newsroom has been pretty profound uh, in the sense that it has allowed us to think more expansively about curation. You know, the Times puts out 300, 200, 300 stories a day no one can possibly read that. A lot of people just want to know, give me the best New York Times stories of the day. So that's what NYT Now is. But it's got us thinking about, well, how can we help people in general navigate this New York Times ecosystem, which is, has all this stuff? So we've thought a lot about curation. And of course, the other thing that has helped us a lot with this is this issue of voice. Voice was always a little bit of a provocative issue with the New York Times. There was a traditional New York Times voice that, people felt, that a lot of people felt inside the newsroom and outside the newsroom was somewhat sacred. People thought it was, you know, it was a little bit neutral, it was a little bit standoffish, it was not conversational, and it was not personal. When we set up the New York Times or the NYT Now app, we tried to create a voice that we thought of as of the Times and not of the Times. 
It was a conversational voice. It was essentially the voice of your smart, close friend telling you about the news. And that has really resonated with a lot of people, and it showed us inside the times that we could do something, and you know what, the world would not, the, the, the universe would not be destroyed if the times was a little bit more personal um, and a little bit more um, closer to you. Natalie, tell me a little bit about the, the voice, this voice issue that you've dealt with at the BBC, because it's another traditional news organization. It's very traditional in some ways, uh, or in many ways. I think where, where we have, we've had more opportunity to play with voices around our feature content, really, um, just because we can explore different issues. It's a broader agenda. It's, it's much harder to play with voice when you're doing subjects that aren't Syria, for example. Um, and I guess the other areas we have, uh, we have something called BBC Trending, which has really kind of informed a lot, of, a lot of what we're doing. And they, as the name indicates, they are mainly looking at social media and seeing what's doing well and kind of doing the journalism behind it. So why is something doing well? And that leads to more and more stories and more and more coverage. And they, because they're kind of of the web natively in a way that other areas of the BBC aren't necessarily, they're able to take that voice as well. So I think that's kind of seeping in which is quite an interesting process as well. Now, you know, everyone wants to do social media stories, but... Yeah, I mean, I think we've had that a little bit as well. One of the things that I've noticed at the Times is, you know, we present Times journalism on a lot of different platforms, obviously. There's the print paper, there's the website, there's the main New York Times app, there's NYT Now, and there's our social platforms. And the truth is, is that the voice is different on these different platforms. And to some extent, it's logical that the voice would be different on different platforms, but in another way of thinking, it's kind of maddening, and um, it drives me a little bit crazy. For example, the voice of the New York Times on Facebook and Twitter is actually quite delightful and lovely, and it's smart, it's conversational. I think it's a great voice, and one of my goals in the coming months and years is actually to get the voice of the New York Times on social more into the main New York Times platforms, because if that voice works for the New York Times on Facebook, why can't it work for the New York Times on the main website? Well, the only reason is it's, to some extent, it's tradition. Um, you might have different audiences, though, no? Yeah, you do, it's a good point, and you do have different audiences. Certainly the audience on Facebook for the Times is younger than the audience for the website, uh, certainly younger than the audience for the newspaper. Having said that, the voice of the New York Times on Facebook is not you know, a wacky kind of um, juvenile voice. It's a smart, sophisticated, conversational voice that is really quite pleasant, and it's quite pleasant to read. And you never read it, and you're like, you never cringe when you read it. You think, hey, this is really attractive. I want to read this story. Um, so this is not just about, uh, and NYT Now, and the voice of NYT Now and the voice of the New York Times on social is somewhat similar. So we're trying to get both of those voices in uh, into the main New York Times platforms. I mean, this kind of leads to a larger theme, which is, when you create one of these news apps, it inevitably has effects on the whole news ecosystem that you're involved with. And to my way of thinking, very positive effects. Have, have you experienced that at the we BBC? We have a question uh, here yes. first. Question. Yeah, I was thinking of what you said about the and, you know, female, uh, female, 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 It's a great, great question. I mean, yeah, thanks, sure. Um, this is, the question was about brevity, and, and if, there, if, you, if we are all striving for brevity, brevity on mobile, or brevity when we're presenting mobile in the morning, is there become a kind of sameness that makes all our journalistic experiences kind of flat and, and, and uninteresting? And I think it's a really good question. Um, but I think we have to start off with the idea that readers will not tolerate length in the morning. So we have to start there. Um, and, and then try to find out the best way to create experiences in the morning on mobile, for example, that are actually somewhat delightful. I mean, the thing about, for example, the morning briefing, which is on NYT Now and all our core platforms, is people like the voice of it a lot, or this thing called New York Today, which is like this New York tip sheet. New York Today in particular, they love the voice because it's kind of a slightly little smart-alecky New York voice. 
It's, you know, hey, we're all in this together. Life in New York is kind of tough, but man, it's an awesome city and let's go get them. And that's a, that's a really cool voice that readers just totally glom onto and they come to. So I think there are ways of taking the basic structure and, forgive the expression, iterating on it a bit or changing it or evolving it to meet the particular needs of your audience. But I think the other thing is the app audience is different to the mobile web audience. So if someone's already coming to your app, they're probably a loyal user. So they want that. But I think the other thing is that you, know, you can do amazing things with apps. So I think particularly if you're looking at cities in which people commute a lot, for example, you could read those brief headlines you know, as you're getting up, but then download stuff for offline consumption for your journey into work, so from that same app. So it's, it's kind of a good way. It's giving you a menu in many ways. I, I, I kind of see short news as a menu. So you know, I just need the headlines on these three, but I really want to delve into this fourth one, fifth one. So I, I, you know, I, don't, I, don't, I don't see it as a massive problem, really. I mean, the, you know, the dirty secret of our age, how many of you guys have Chartbeat? You ever use the scroll depth function on Chartbeat? Have you ever looked to see how far down people read on articles? Does that make your heart sink? <laughs> so look, the, 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 the fact is, is that even the finest works of journalism, which hopefully everyone in this audience has produced, it's hard to get people to read entire articles. It really is. And it's especially hard to get people to read entire articles at particular times of day. So you can't fight that. You know, your audience is your audience. The time of day is the time of day. You have to really be sensitive to that. Um, and again, that's the thing that mobile has taught me. I have to be obsessively thinking about who is my user, what is my user doing at this particular time, and how can I meet the needs of my user at this particular time? Question back there. I think, I think you're absolutely right. I think control is a very important thing. I mean, you know, there's a limit to how much you can do unless you have armies of people who can reversion everything at different durations or you know, different lengths. But, but there is something about giving people what they need when they need it. And even if you, can't, if you can't do three different versions of an article, for example, you can make sure that you give them enough information that just reading the first screen is enough for them to understand the story and not force them to kind of scroll and scroll and scroll to find the important bits. So there's stuff you can do, but I do agree control is really important. And what we've seen, which I find quite interesting, is with our, one, of the, one of the big new things that we introduced with our new app was around personalization around topics. And we went from very, very niche and granular topics to very broad things. So you can follow technology, but you can also follow a company or a story. And what we've seen is people do actually use that quite a lot. So I think about setting where between a third and half of the audience actually choose to follow topics, but they also deselect and reselect and they play around with it. And that is giving people control. So they have a tab in the app where they can go in the morning if they want or whenever they want and just see stuff that they want to, they want to catch up on. Yeah, I mean, this is actually a really fascinating area, uh, this issue of control, this issue of personalization this issue of active personalization and passive personalization on apps. You know, there is a whole kind of contrarian point of view, which I will now voice, uh, which says that actually readers just want a small amount of stuff, that they're extremely overwhelmed with all the journalism and all the content, albeit great journalism and great content out there. I mean, NYT Now is a very consumable feed. It's very short. You can get through it, you can get a sense of satisfaction, and you don't get overwhelmed. So there's these different, and, and that experience, by the way, appeals to a lot of people and doesn't appeal to a lot of people. So there's kind of different experiences, and I think we have to be very, very mindful of that. For some people, it's great to be playing around in a news ecosystem that has en enormous amounts of choice, allows you to personalize it, allows you to personalize it at any given time. They love that. 
There are other people who are like, my life is very overwhelming. Don't make me choose 15 different stories to read. Just give me one, especially at a particular time of day when you're very, very busy. So again, it's a sort of a very complicated thing. There are no easy answers. I mean, a lot of the stuff that Natalie and I are talking about, this is an art. This is not a science. Um, and part of it has to really do with, with your particular audience, where your publication is, um, and kind of learning from your audience. It's difficult because I think we talk about the audience, but actually we all have many audiences. Exactly. And that the same person might be a different type of audience during the day at different times of day. So it's, it's, it's incredibly hard and it's incredibly hard to create one product that satisfies all those needs and all those audiences. I don't know if that's why you have two apps, but. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, you have a question there? I mean, look, it's incredibly hard. Uh, and obviously, you know, when we developed NYT Now, we worked very, very closely with the, people, the product uh, people at the Times, product executives at the Times, developers, designers. We thought a lot about, like, what should this app be and which, what are the most important use cases? I mean, part of it is an issue of scale. You know, how can you reach, given that you can only create a certain type of app at any given time, what's the largest audience that you can reach with this particular app? Um, and then like everything else, it's a lot of compromises in terms of um, dev time, developer time, software engineering, design, product, all that sort of stuff. I mean, I know that's not a great answer to your question, but it's, it's a very, very, very complicated, challenging issue. Yeah. Okay. That is a great question. Uh, <laughs> so uh, at the times, you know, with the NYT Now staff, we were actually physically removed from the newsroom, um, extracted forcibly from removed, the newsroom, forcibly yeah. removed from the newsroom. So the newsroom is on the third floor of the times, the main newsroom, and we went up on the ninth floor, which is an area that people from the newsroom never go to. It's like where developers work and people from the business side. And we had a tiny little team and we spent a lot of time talking about this issue of voice and presentation and framing. And we workshopped it over and over again. And I, I, I like to say that we wanted to kind of institutionalize a certain creativity. We wanted to essentially institutionalize a, the voice of NYT now. And you know, it was this kind of of the times, but not of the times. It was something that a times person might recognize, but not make a times person cringe. Uh, we talked a lot about how it's the voice. The thing that, that really helped me convince people about it, I would say to them, you ever go to dinner parties? When people find out you work for the New York Times and they want to talk to you about stories that you've covered or you know about at the New York Times, do you tell them? Yeah. How do you describe them? In a conversational way. You come across as smart, friendly, collegial, People are riveted, right? Put that voice in the app. Don't put the voice in the app of the, the old front page from 1962. Put the dinner party voice in the app. And we put the dinner party voice in the app, and people loved it. And no, you know, people in the newsroom, most people in the newsroom of the Times were like, oh, that's pretty cool. I like that. There weren't a lot of people in the, in the newsroom of the Times who were like, oh my god, it's the apocalypse. There were a few, but uh, not that many. But it's, it's hard. There's a question back there. I think in general, people tend to read longer stuff in the evening. But again, I think there's no, different people behave in different ways. If you have a one hour commute, you might well want to read a, a long piece in the morning. So I think it's giving people options. But I think it's, it's understanding that in the morning, most people want a really quick shot. It doesn't mean that the rest of it's not available, but it might not be kind of a forefront of, of your first screen, if you want. We also used a save for later feature on NYT Now. Uh, we pushed it pretty aggressively. So if we were going to present long form stuff to readers, and again, I want to emphasize this, don't let anyone ever tell you that readers don't want long form on mobile. It's a complete falsity. It's complete BS. We get tremendous engagement 
on long form at the, at the times on mobile. Some of our longest stories get completely consumed with tremendous delight and satisfaction on mobile. Um, there are, however, issues of time of day, but they're, they're being read. Um, we pushed Save for Later a lot, so if we were presenting long form on mobile in the morning, people all, all had the option to save it and read it later. There's a question over there. So I think our experience on mobile is that, yes, you definitely have big audiences during the day. It's, it's a much, so the traditional desktop curve was always kind of like a bell, I guess, with a peak at lunchtime. With mobile, you get a peak, but then it kind of goes a bit flat, so it's more like a valley, I right. guess. And then it peaks again in the evening. But you do have, I mean, in some ways, people are kind of, I don't like the word second screening, but there's second screening at work, so they might have a desktop, but they're still using their mobile as well. And then they're using it again at home while they're watching TV or doing other things. So it's... I think it's more and more something that's being used across the day. And people use it, you know, in theory, it was always billed as something that was people on the move. But actually, there's more and more evidence that people just use it at home because, you know, who can be bothered to get the tablet that's in a different room or, or go and get a computer? We also found, um, you know, I don't want to give slight to the, the tablet, which is important, obviously, for our journalism and I think for everybody's journalism. The use cases on the tablet are slightly different than the phone. At the times, for example, the highest traffic on the tablet is on Sundays. And what we realized is that uh, people who had graduated from print to digital were using the tablet as a substitute for the Sunday print paper. And so we, we started thinking about how can we curate a different mix on the tablet on Sunday to create kind of those moments of delight that you get when you read the Sunday paper. So in a, in a lot of these areas, you have to be... Obviously, this becomes like this stew of factors that you have to be thinking about. But you really want to let the analytics kind of inform what your understanding is of user behavior and how you're creating your journalism. Now, again, the analytics don't dictate. They just inform. Um, but it, it's very, very, you can't really create an app without really digging into the analytics. All right, there's a question over there and then over there. Speak a little bit about notifications, just best practice. Oh, yeah. No, sir? Um, yeah, so we're quite strict about notifications. So they are currently managed by our front page editors. The bar's pretty high, uh, just because we think it can be quite disruptive to get too many. So it genuinely has to be breaking news, and it has to be of quite a magnitude. Now, that's relatively easy when you're looking at the UK audience, because it's one unified audience in the same time zone. It gets incredibly complicated when we're looking at our international app, where we have one app for the rest of the world outside the UK. And so, you know, is the person in South Africa really that interested in what's happening in the States sometimes? But, you know, it's a balance, and it's just trying not to be too intrusive and not abuse it, because it is a very effective way of getting people to your stories. But I think it's one of those things that if you overuse, people will just stop it and delete it. Yeah, that's to I totally agree with that. I mean, I, I like to say that it's, uh, push notifications are incredibly powerful and incredibly dangerous. If you overuse them, if you push out stuff that readers don't find valuable, or you send it at the wrong time, they will just shut it off. And if they shut it off, they will never turn it back on. So you have to be very, very sensitive to that. At the times, we're, we are very sensitive to that. We tend to push out stuff a little bit less than most news organizations. Having said that, we've been experimenting a lot in the last few months, six months or so, with sending push notifications for some of our best investigations and enterprise pieces. And those have been very, very successful. Uh, the rate of engagement has, has, has increased dramatically. Um, but we're trying to do that in a very deliberative, deliberative way, to be very careful about that, to only send out a push notification um, at the right moment with the right framing and the right tone. The truth is, is that I think for us at the times, our kind of UI, our user experience on push notifications is, is still a little bit backward. We need to make a lot of improvements on that. Um, other news organizations, BuzzFeed in particular, has done a great job on pushing forward on that, giving you more control over your notifications. Uh, at the times, we've been able to create some sub-channels. We have sub-channels for politics, New York, and, um, and business. And uh, we use those to, to kind of give readers notifications for specific stuff that they've asked for. The future, of course, is notifications for everything, um, in the sense that you will be able to opt in if Paul Krugman, the op-ed columnist for The Times, has, publishes a new column, you will be able to get a push notification for that if you ask for it. 
Um, but that, that's some months off. But I think when that comes, that's going to allow us to increase engagement a lot more on the phone. It's also quite interesting. We've found that um, for some people, the behavior when they wake up in the morning is basically they check their notifications. I, I find it quite useful as well. Like, you know, what news is broken during the night while I'm asleep? So it, it does different things as well. I mean, as long as you have them on, on silent, I guess. There was another question there. Yeah. That, that is a great question. Um, you know, the truth is, is that for the times we have these long time readers who have graduated from print, you know, a reader who is in her 40s or 50s might have grown up on the Science time on, Times on Tuesday. So she is habituated to the Science Times on Tuesday and she goes and looks for it, even though a lot of our stuff in weekly sections is now published across the week. So dining in particular, which comes out on Wednesday, we're publishing dining stories every single day. We put them in print only on Wednesday, but they're published every single day. Having said that, on the phone, traffic to dining stories jumps on Wednesdays. And it's not because we're pushing it out to people, it's because people are coming to it. The truth is, is that I'm extremely conflicted about this. <laughs> like, I don't really even know how to respond to it. Should we be giving more people, uh, people di more dining stuff on Wednesdays? Should we be actually reinforcing that habituation on Wednesdays and dining? Or is that bad? Like, I can't quite decide whether it's a really good behavior or a bad behavior. I mean, I'm sort of contradicting myself because earlier I said, follow your users. Um, but do we want to follow our older users? I don't know. I mean, it's a, it's a really, really interesting question. So I don't have a great answer. I think answer. it's also interesting. Do you think, I, I really don't know, do you, can you create habit on mobile in a way that you could with print? I think you can, and I think you should. Um, I mean, habit is the most important thing on so, mobile. So I mean, not the habit of checking the news, which hopefully right, will exactly. never end. But, but daily, ha like, daily habits like or weekly Wednesday, habits, yeah. I mean, here's the thing. At the times, we have increasingly come to the realization that habituation is the secret to everything. Um, I mean, I'm being a little bit glib, but for, we have a subscription model. And so it is very important that, A, we get people to come to us once, and then we get people to come to us a second day in the span of a month or so. That is very, very important. It begins the process of habituation. You want to get someone from being a casual user to a registered user to a subscriber. That's hard. You know, you talk about a big funnel, pouring everyone at the top of the funnel, and then you get a smaller, very small number of people to be subscribers. The way you do that is you create strong, a strong sense of habituation. And you know, one of the things I tell people, and this is a, perhaps a slightly inappropriate, improper analogy, but you know, if you go into McDonald's, you know what you're getting. One of the reasons that fast food or a lot of American commoditization is very, very popular is because you know what you're getting. We in the news business have been very, very bad at that because we think the news is cacophonous. You know, it just sort of happens. It's crazy. It's wacky. You can never predict it. All of that's true. However, we should be creating certain habitual experiences. So when people know when they come to us, this is what they're going to get. Now, we used to do that at the times with the dining section on Wednesday. If 25 years ago or 20 years ago, the Wednesday paper came out without the dining section, there would be an uproar among our readers. We need to create that same sense today on mobile of habituation. You know, this morning, um, there was a tremendous amount of news, obviously, with the Boehner resignation and the Pope in New York. There was just a lot going on. Um, but we still kept our morning briefing up there because certain people want to come to the morning briefing. They come to it every morning. They want to know it's there. I think, was there another question back there? Um, yeah, two. Questions? Yeah, there's some, two back there and then one here and there. And here. That's a really good question. I think it really depends on what your own priorities are and what you think you get from the different platforms. Um, I, I think it varies from organization to organization. So do you, get, do you get much of a return from putting your stuff on Snapchat or Line? You know, do, so how much do you want to invest in it? I, I think where, where it gets harder is with apps and 
which is just quite expensive to develop and maintain. So it's whether, it's whether you think you'll develop a loyal audience and can get it to them. I mean, the reality is that people download a ton of apps and probably use a handful. So if you need to be that hand, in that handful, really. You know, the, the app business is very, very brutal. I'll be quite frank. It is brutal. Uh, most people, as, as Natalie said, they use only a few apps. They might use Facebook. They might use Twitter. They might use one news app. But they might also just read your publication on mobile web through Facebook or through Twitter. And so I think you have to, you know, it's important to be thinking about that. At the times, the vast majority of our mobile traffic is on mobile web, and it's through the social web, the vast majority. Having said that, the vast majority of engagement, habituation on mobile is through apps. So you have a much smaller audience on apps, but they're tremendously engaged, and they're paying subscribers. You have a much larger audience on mobile web, but there are a lot of what we call one and dones. They'll come to us through Facebook once a month, they'll come to us through Twitter once a month, and that's it. Yes? What's uh, the main purpose of your push, uh, push uh, messages? Is it to inform the audience in the push itself, or is it to, to pull the audience into your pages or articles? And um, a second one, uh, when do you lose your uh, audience? When do they unsubscribe from your messages? Uh, so I see, it as a, I see it as a true service, really. I think if you, sub, if you subscribe to breaking news alerts, it is because you, just want, you often just want the headline. You don't, you don't always, you're not always going to click on that story, though you do see quite high rates, but I do see it as a service. Um, and I think if you go into personalization, then it becomes something different. If you, if you can opt into a ton of stuff, then that's fine. That's your call. And then you would want to be pushing people to, to your app. Um, in terms of, sorry, your second question was? Uh, when do you lose your audience? Oh. When, when do they... Uh, when do they unsubscribe? Yeah. When do they turn off? Yeah. I, I think we, mm, that's interesting. I think it's sometimes if, if, if you very strongly like, for example, domestic news and you really not into international news and suddenly get five in a row that are international, you, you kind of see those behaviors. But it's not, I don't, I don't think the rates of unsubscription are that big because I think you just need to be very careful into what you push and really make sure that it meets a certain bar. You know, at the times, one thing we've seen is that there are a lot of people who just use push notifications, and that's it. They just, they, they live off their lock screen, essentially. They don't go any deeper. But there are a lot of people who are pulled into the New York Times app through push notifications. And that is very, very powerful. powerful. In fact, one of the things that we've noticed is when we send a breaking news alert, people will read that story, and then they'll start reading other stories. So it has a very beneficial effect across the whole news ecosystem. And it was something that I didn't really expect uh, when I started looking at the, at the analytics, how it kind of benefits us uh, uh, sort of across um, other articles as well. I mean, I, I like to think of it as, um, you know, this thing is inert. It's sitting in your pocket. It's on your desk. It's in your pocketbook. And all of a sudden, it just taps you on your shoulder and, and says, hey, pay attention to the news. You're not, you may not just read one article. You may read a few articles. But before that, you forgot that this really existed. Yes? Um, we don't, at the times, we don't have the technology yet to do that, um, but it's something I'd love to do. Yeah, no, we don't know. I mean, we, you know, it, there's something somewhat akin to when, when someone comes to us through Twitter or Facebook. What, what's the question? Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, the question was uh, whether we had considered changing content for a user who comes in through notification through a push alert. And I was saying is that we don't have the technology to do that, but it's something I would be very interested in doing. And I was also saying there's an analogy to coming to the Times through Facebook or Twitter, yeah. for example. We often show you other stuff that people who are coming through Facebook or Twitter are interested in. The idea is to, again, at the Times you like to think of it as just get users to do one more thing. It's very, very important. So a question.
you can actually do both. Um, it's not easy, and I, <laughs> I'm not sure anyone's cracked it, but I don't, I don't see it as impossible because I think you can, I think it goes back to the kind of scannability. You can have a service where actually here are your tanky headlines, but if you're a super user, you're actually going to personalize, so you can go way deeper or go into different areas. So I think it's probably the keys in personalization, really. I will say uh, power users are a real challenge because they're a little bit like the false friend in the sense of everyone in your newsroom is a power user. So often they curate the news experience for power users and that's a real problem. So how does that manifest itself? Oh, there's an awesome story from the New York Times. We're going to put it on the center of the homepage of the New York Times or on the main New York Times app or Martina for two hours and then we're going to take it off because everyone's seen it who could have possibly seen it. It does, that's not really the reality, right? The reality is that most people come to our, uh, our platforms once a day, once every two days. You cannot be curating your platforms for power users. You have to be mindful of them. You have to love them. They're often you know, subscribers. They're very, very important. They, at the Times, they're about 4% of our audience. So the vast majority of our audience at the Times are drive-by people. Our real mission, one of our biggest mission, is, is to get our claws into the drive-by people, to create a crazy metaphor, um, uh, and, to keep, and to keep them coming, and to get them coming back. Again, we don't want to, um, we don't want to insult the power users, we want them to be very happy. But well, the thing I'm off, I often talk to my editors about in the newsroom is, of the Times is, think about the general user, think about the average user, don't think about the power user. Uh, We've got one more question. It's one right here. Or two. Why don't you start there? Um, just on that, uh, on that note about getting your claws into the drive-by, how do you onboard people to the app? When you're doing meetings, when you're doing the social web, and the mobile web, how do you get them to want to come to the app? And how do you get them to want to come to the app? And how do you get them to want to come to the app? And how do you get them to want to come to the app? And how do you get them to want to come to the app? And how do you get them to want to come to the app? And how do you get them to want to come to the app? And how do you get them to want to come to the app? And how do you get them to want to come to the app? And how do you get them to want to come to the app? And how do you get them to want to come to the app? And how do you get them to want to come to the app? And how do you get them to want to come to the app? And how do you get them to want to come to the app? And how do you get them to want to come to the app? And how do you get them to want to come to the app? And how do you get them to want to come to the app? And how do you get them to want to come to the app? And how do you get them to want to we're kind of lucky in that sense. But the truth is, is that that's not good enough because a lot of people just will experience us through Facebook or Twitter or happen to go by the mobile web. So we, we do have to find ways to ensure that the app experience is fantastic, um, that we have great visuals, that we have great videos, that everything is pristine. And that takes a lot of effort. And you have better download time. So you know, yeah. apps do have, do have great advantages. So you, you just need to be able to market those, I think, and also just offer, I think it is about offering people something that little bit extra, or the moments of delight, or something that you might not do routinely on the mobile web. And we beg also. You know, please don't delete me. <laughs> um, one more question, yeah. So for us, it's about um, it's between a third and half and 50 percent who've who've customised it. Um, obviously, a smaller percentage of those do it routinely, so actually remove stuff from their list and add new things. So, yeah. what, so, um, so what, that's why we see the bulk, our most followed topics are the big generic ones like technology, or world, or UK, and then there's smaller traffic for the for the slightly more granular stuff because. I'm, yeah, I'm somewhat conflicted on this question because uh, I think that a lot of people ask for personalization and they never use it or use it once when they first onboard and then forget about it and never use it again. It's a very, it's a deeply, deeply problematic area. I, I believe that the best course is probably, you know, 70% passive personalization with some cluing in the reader to that and then 30% active personalization. Give people the opportunity to do it, make it easy for them, but don't ever rely upon it. Because the fact is, is that we all have very busy lives. We don't have time to figure out, toggle this, toggle that. But I, I, I also think there are generational differences. Right. So I think younger people are more likely to personalize than you know, the, the older, more traditional users. You're just like, just give me the news, tell me what I need to know, bye-bye kind of thing. Right. So. All right. Thank you, guys. Thank you for coming. Thanks.